Welcome back into the Lions 24-7 podcast. It's our final episode of a very busy September here in Happy Valley. Penn State reaches the end of this month at 4-0 on the season, number seven now in national rankings, up a couple spots from where they were in that AP Top 25 prior to a 21-7 victory over Illinois. Illinois still inside the top 25 themselves, dropping a bit from number 19. We spent a lot of time breaking down that matchup late in Beaver Stadium. Daniel Gallon and myself late Saturday night, early Sunday morning. Hopefully you've had a chance to check out about 45 minutes of post-game podcast coverage. As usual on Monday, we start to pick up the pieces a bit coming out of the last matchup, start to look forward to what's happening with a new game week. And we've got a newcomer to the Big Ten heading to Happy Valley this weekend, a struggling one at that, one and three, UCLA coming in as a four-touchdown underdog. That's a game we'll focus on a lot more later on in this week as we get some of that new feel in a familiar conference for Penn State. But bringing in Mark Brennan and Daniel Gallon now, we are fresh out of Beaver Stadium once again. This time it's for a weekly James Franklin press conference on a Monday. Want to welcome you both back in, but as usual, we begin these Monday shows with Mark, who doesn't have a chance to chime in on the postgame podcast. So, Mark, 21-7 to victory in the books for Penn State. Uh, they certainly handled their business in a lot of important ways against a ranked opponent. What did you come out of that matchup thinking about these Nittany Lions? I mentioned to you guys before the show, I'm losing my voice a little bit, so I apologize if I have to mute out here at any point. But, you know, you guys covered most of it in, in the post game. Uh, I made my player players of the game the offensive line. I mean, I know people like to look at the stats that people uh, kind of generate in a specific game, but for that line to do the job it did, losing Sal Wormley early, I mean, I thought that was just unbelievable. You know, it, it wasn't that long ago, you know, due to the sanctions right after Franklin got here, that they really didn't even ha have one or two Big Ten caliber offensive guards. And now to be able to dip that deep and then late in the game, you go to Cooper Cousins. I just thought that was, uh, you know, just tremendous and a great sign going into Big Ten play. Defensively, I know people on the board were a little riled up about Abdul Carter's play early, but the way he came on, I just think it kind of typified, you know, personified the effort of the entire defense. Everybody was kind of lost on that first series or so, but he just clicked it into gear and became the game record that I think we were all expecting to see from the beginning beginning of the season. So that transition to D end, uh, I think it, it's it's where it needs to be at this point. I also wonder if Tom Allen wasn't holding some things back with him and they finally decided to unleash it. Those were the two big things. Penalties, you know, listen, I don't know how many times you can say, a coach can say you're embarrassed by it or whatever, but it wasn't just the penalties. It was who was committing some of those penalties. Abdul Carter, Amin Vanover with two big penalties. I give Rojas a pass because I, I think that was a bad call. And was it Zion Tracy late? I give him a little bit of a pass because he's a young guy and I think he was a little over enthusiastic. But your veteran players cannot be making those kind of mistakes. And I wrote this in my game wrap. You know, that that won't possibly cost you a game. That will cost you a game if it keeps up. Mark my word that if that keeps up, that will cost him a game at some point. Overall, I thought it was a really nice win. I, I, I like that Illinois team. Uh, they have an off week. Then they get uh, another off week against Purdue. Then they play Michigan. And I'm, they get Michigan at home. And I'm really anxious to see that game because – that seems like the sort of team that Bielema, that could be another nine overtime game, right? I mean, that seems like two op dysfunctional offensive teams that could just be kind of clashing. It's going to be like a, 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 a an odd thing to, to, to enjoy watching, I think. So I'm anxious to see what this Illinois team kind of becomes. So I know I've rambled on and on. Uh, despite claiming my voice is bothering me, but uh, those were some of my thoughts. Sorry. Yeah, you're off to a strong start, Mark. And 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 I'm getting in as much as I possibly can <laughs> before I, I, it goes. Two years ago, when Michigan was on their way to a Big Ten championship, they they 
you know, squeezed out a, a win over in Illinois. And that was in Ann Arbor, a two point win a couple of years ago. I'm with you. I think this win will age pretty well based on what we've seen from Illinois so far this season, what lies ahead of them on their schedule. Um, and, and, you know, it, it doesn't maybe it doesn't matter as much now at the expanded playoff field, but you want your wins to, to age better than than looking worse when you get to October and November. They're and, still in the top 25, Tyler. I mean, I, and, and Daniel, I thought that that's a great sign for Penn State to me that, that that's saying these voters valued how good Penn State was. I mean, the fact that Illinois didn't drop out, I think that's a great sign for Penn State. Yeah, I agree. Um, Daniel, when we look through those players of the game, we're going to get into more on Adler Carter a little bit later because he was also just named the, the Big Ten Defensive Player of the Week. I want to get into a little bit of how his role uh, could evolve over the next eight regular season matchups and, and what they've done with him thus far. But on the offensive side, no surprise to see Penn State staff pick those two running backs, Katron Allen, Nick Singleton. They've been getting it done together for, for three seasons now. But coming out of season two, it was fair to wonder what exactly that dynamic duo was going to look like because they weren't quite as dynamic as we thought they would as sophomores. And that was largely because Nick Singleton wasn't quite who we thought he was going to be last year. Not the case anymore. And with these two guys who both believe they are the best duo, James Franklin feels the same way. Confidence has been high for a long time. And, and Jaywan Sider feeds into that for these players. But it really feels like they're at the tip of the spearhead right now. All due respect to Drew Aller because of, of the games they have accrued to this point, the way they're currently feeling about themselves, and also, perhaps most importantly, the way their current offensive coordinator is allowing them to dictate terms to opponents. Definitely. I, I think both Allen and Singleton are just playing really, really good football right now. You know, for Katron Allen, we, we've joked about the stats over the course of his career, just how steady they are. He's just a metronome back there. Um, but with Singleton, having him be explosive, I, I think it it complements that really well. Like if if you're getting what you're getting from Katron Allen um, by itself, that's great. But if you can supplement that with Nick Singleton hitting those home runs, breaking off eight yards, nine yards carry. I mean, that's just really, really big for an offense and, and what you can do to a defense. Um, so to see, see the staff recognize those two players, I mean, it was kind of no surprise. I don't really know where else where else you would have gone, but yeah, you know, they're just staying very, very even, uh, very, very consistent. They both had 18 touches. They both have the same number of carries on the year. Um, I think they're within overall touches. I think they're within three or four or no, they're within five. Um, so you're seeing a steady diet of both. And, and so far they're delivering. I feel like last year, guys, with Nick Singleton, you get to the end of the game uh, a lot in the regular season and the stats wouldn't look great. You, you're trying to think of moments where he really impacted the game. And, and those were a little more few and far between than what we thought you know, every week. Now, there's several moments. The first possession of this game when Penn State needed to come up with their response after Illinois opening touchdown drive. Singleton has a 16-yard catch. He has a 14-yard run. They, they worked their way to the end zone in the form of a Tyler uh, Warren rushing touchdown. But, Mark, this is, again, very much like Omari Evans. You change your offensive coordinator, all of a sudden you know, there's a huge uptick in production. Now, Singleton had a lot more history to lean on than Omari Evans did, but he's now really putting together quite a spin. You go back over his last five regular season games, he's averaging 105 yards per game. He's averaging seven and a half yards per carry during that span, going back to the Black Friday matchup uh, last November. And and I'll tell you what, if this isn't the English, Nick Singleton that the Nittany Lions are getting, and at this point we're a third of the way through the season, so I think we can feel pretty comfortable in saying that it is, it really changes the outlook for what this program can accomplish offensively because you tie in what the, the explosive numbers have looked like in the passing game, not so much against Illinois, and you marry that with what Nick Singleton can accomplish. This is the formula that was so unfortunately missing last season when you had an elite defense holding down the other side of the ball. Yeah, and I think it all stems back to one of those three things we were talking about with Kotal Nicky's offense, the lack of the – the lack of predictability or being unpredictable. And, and I think that's what's freeing Nick Singleton up. I mean, all he needs to do is get a little bit of space and he's making the most of it. And now what are we seeing? He's getting that space and he's not only making the most of it, but now he has that level of confidence when he meets the defender, he's either beating the defender or he's running through the defender. And even if he gets tackled, I think that's a great thing. And, you know, I think the other guy, Tyler, that – it would be remiss if we didn't mention what Kotal Nicky is doing with Tyler Warren. I mean, to me, the most impressive run in that game, they had a third and five. 
in the third quarter, I think it was. It's still a tight game. And they have Tyler Warren run wildcat straight up the middle. This is 6'5", 270 pounds. And that's making a statement against a team that is known for being tough against the run. And, you know, he's already thrown a pass. He's pitched a ball. And he, they're doing all these things with this massive weapon. So, yeah, I mean, this has been great for Marty Evans, and it's been great for Nick Singleton. But he has a weapon in Tyler Warren that, you know, I don't know how you, you, you stop that dude. I mean, because he's going to beat you one way or the other. And I also think what, – imagine what this is doing for Tyler Warren's NFL stock, you know? I mean, obviously it's helping Nick Singleton to get back to what we thought he was. And, and, and I think now we could say that we know he is. But Tyler Warren, he was highly regarded before this. When they see him doing all of these things, that sort of versatility in the NFL is going to serve him so well. Been so valuable. Just a quick note: you had him at six five two seventy. You're gonna take take ten pounds away from him at an inch six six okay. two sixty. Either way, it's I still a don't boat. want him running over me. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's a lot to deal with, especially when you've got good blocking. And to answer uh, the question that you brought up earlier, um, where else would you have gone with uh, with this MVP on offense? The offensive line as a whole is probably where you could have given a nod to. Yeah, that's what I did. What dealt with, yeah. Um, and, and so let's finish, uh, or not finish, we're going to get to special teams as well, but addressing the defensive players of the game. Abdul Carter, no surprise there. Again, a little more on him later. But Zane Durant, this is, I believe, back-to-back -back weeks where Penn State staff looks in his direction as defensive player of the week. I think it was a little less apparent against Kent State. Some of the stuff he does wasn't reflected as much in the stat sheet. This time around, if you took a look at the box score, you probably took notice of, of what Durant did on the day. Um, you know, he was four tackles, two of them for loss. He had four pressures on the day. Um, a guy who has been super effective against the run and also penetrative uh, as a pass rusher as well. I mean, we're seeing it all come together uh, in his arsenal right now, Daniel. He's a guy that when you want to talk about draft stock, he's a junior right now. And he is, I think, going to have a lot of people ears perked up in that league about what he's doing. He's always going to be, quote unquote, undersized at that defensive tackle position. But the way he's moving right there, the way he's producing with authority, it matches up with the preseason hype. And I think it's going to be a really important catalyst for this entire defense as they continue to work their way through conference action. Zane Durant was the defensive player of the game against Bowling Green uh, three Bowling weeks Green. ago. And Abdul was also the player of the game uh, last week against uh, against Kent State. So, you know, they each get their own and then they get to share one uh, against Illinois. But yeah, I think that there's so with the pass rush, there's so much focus on the edge guys coming around like Denai Dennis Sutton. Uh, like Abdul Carter, you know, that's where a lot of the big sack numbers come from. But you really can't underrate what it's like to have someone that's that, uh, as James Franklin said, impactful on the interior. Um, that can just cause a lot of problems for for an opposing offense. And I think we've really seen that. If Zane Durant is making things work on the inside, then you can flush the quarterback out and let some of those defensive ends clean things up. Um, he's just playing at a really, really high level right now. Uh, one thing I noted uh, from these players of the game is that four of the five players who got recognized Sunday, they're part of that class of 2022. Uh, since the start of the year, Penn State has recognized six. They've had 16 players of the game. Some of those are, are duplicates, but nine of those 16 nods have gone to that class of 2022 as well. So you talk, we talk about that group this being kind of it for them that you want to see them come through. This is a group that you expected to lift you, um, you know, into that national championship level, given the talent you brought in, this is their window right now. And I think that you're showing it, you're seeing it with how those guys are showing up on a week to week basis right now. You got a lot of established dudes in that mix, but you also have a lot of stock up guys right now. It feels like from that 2022 class and uh, they are at the nucleus of this entire 2024 uh, effort to, to punch their ticket to the college football playoff. And, and how about Takari Nelson now guys back to back weeks where the staff looks in his direction as special teams, a player of the game. We had heard some really good things about, uh, about him from special teams coordinator, Justin Lustig during the bye week about the effort he was giving about some of the things he was putting on film that maybe weren't apparent to the fans or, or us in the press box. Uh, he also started last week, though, and we'll get into more on that situation with Dom DeLuca. But he played about 23 snaps. That, that was way below where Kobe King and Dom and uh, 
it's Kobe King and Tony Rojas were. They've been defensive mainstays. That third linebacker position, we haven't even really seen that as a starting position. Uh, it was on Saturday. The Kari got some run. And on Monday, got quite a bit of praise from James Franklin, who said the light has come on for Nelson, who's just a year removed from coming to campus as a very intriguing top 24-7 prospect out of Alabama. He was at the safety room until about mid-August, made the move to linebacker, and there he was starting his first game. We think his role will, will probably take a bit of a step back moving forward, but James Franklin even pointed out today, Mark, that they may find ways to make sure he continues to be involved on defense regardless of how things are at the top of the depth chart. Yeah, and he, he they're hoping to get Dom DeLuca back, but at what capacity is he going to be? I mean, we saw him. It was his right hand. It looked like his thumb was in a cast. So, I mean, I guess they can club you up, uh, you know, when you're over on defense. But, you know, is he going to be full throttle after missing some time? So, Dakari could see some 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 playing time there. But I love the fact that, yeah, it's great that he starts, but for him to be consistently getting it done on special teams – that's how you kind of differentiate yourself as a young player. I mean, to, to me, it's great to be named offensive or defensive player of the week. And, and most people can see exactly what they're doing. But when you're doing it on special teams, that means these coaches are really going into the tape. Not that they're not doing it for offense and defense, but it's, it's more difficult to stand out on special teams, I guess is what I'm saying. There's fewer opportunities. And we, I think, I know I do. I don't know about you guys. I have to take a closer look on what at what he's doing on special teams. You know, maybe get the the Brennan camera or the binoculars and ca- kind of zero in because obviously it's something good. I, I'm really looking forward to doing that in the next couple games. Yeah, when when I had asked that question about Franklin, I I had it in my head last night that the second half needed to be like. So what exactly is he doing on special teams that that we're you know not seeing or, or, or glossing over because uh, he doesn't have the tackles like Tamia Robinson did in, in week one. But um, yeah, I just think that that's one way to stand out. And James Franklin said there's kind of a um, uh, a correlation between doing good things on special teams and then getting those opportunities on offense or defense. And Nelson was easily the most utilized linebacker against Illinois beyond you know the two mainstays, as I said, and King and Rojas. You had Tyler Elson and Tamia Robinson getting about a 10% defensive snap share over the course of that evening and then surprisingly because of what James Franklin said with him being green lit if uh if Dom DeLuca wasn't available last Saturday we didn't see any of freshman Anthony Anthony Specka after he led the team with five tackles a week earlier versus Kent State um jumping over from players of the game to kind of the ramifications of these injury updates that we're getting from James Franklin uh we just touched on it there Dom DeLuca is expected to be back. I think the best word uh, that James Franklin uh, used was anticipating. He said Penn State is, in quote, anticipating to get DeLuca and a couple other veterans back. Uh, either they missed last game or they exited last game because of an injury issue, of course, with DeLuca. He was listed as out before kickoff. We just covered the territory of, of what happened when he was not on the field. And then Sal Wormley, a guy who started his 30th game at right guard, against Illinois. He left relatively early in the matchup, only played about 14 snaps. Um, All these are on specified injuries. I'll just make that clear to start. Um, But when it comes to Wormley, he goes out and we see a little bit of a shuffle. Vengo Ioane, your starting left guard, now at right guard. JB Nelson comes in off the bench, a guy with starting experience at left guard. He slots in there um, and and then he exits the game. We did not get an update today from James Franklin. I think that's something that that hopefully we'll get Wednesday when we get a look at practice and hear from James again afterwards. Uh, But JB Nelson exits the game. That means fourth quarter. Cooper Cousins show at right guard. He checks in at right guard. Venga Ioane back to left guard. Meanwhile, the tackles, the center, uh, they were steadily used throughout. Didn't see a lot of movement there. But I think this is really good news. Um, It goes without saying when a guy started 30 games for you. But the interior depth, Daniel, has worked so well for Penn State through the first third of this season. And we know what it might mean for them moving forward. So you, again, you have Cooper Cousins as more of a luxury right th- right now versus a guy that you've got to put in and play. And I think they have a lot of confidence that if they needed to, he'd be ready to roll. He looked good in the fourth quarter. He played more than 40 snaps last week against Kent State. And then J.B. Nelson, you know, we got to wait and see on that one. But he's a guy who's got plenty of experience under his belt. He's impressed at times out there. I think ultimately this makes sure that you can lock in Venga Ioane at left guard at the very least. And then if Wormley, it needs to be on a limited snap count initially coming off of what he's ever coming off of. 
then you have Cooper Cousins to turn to. And if he doesn't, then you operate as normal. Again, the deeper you can get into a season where you're not having to, to, to kind of go to plan B on the offensive line, I think that the better because eventually you'll get there. And right now, though, I think Phil Troutwine maybe avoids having to do that based on the prognosis with Wormley that we got from James Franklin. I know I've made the comment uh, on the defensive side of the ball about defensive end and, and safety and linebacker where it's easy to say that you have depth and then one guy goes down then two guys go down and suddenly that depth disappears quickly. I mean, with that interior of the offensive line, you lost two of your of your top guards and you didn't really feel it. You didn't really notice it out there. So that's just really, really impressive uh, you know, to what Phil Troutwine has done, the development, the recruiting uh, everything that goes into it. Um, but it'll be interesting to see. I know that a lot of people were excited to see Cooper Cousins get that full run. Um, you know, we'd seen him a little bit earlier on, but it still looked like that Sal Wormley had that job uh, tightened up on the right side. Um, so we'll we'll see. I mean, I think that, you know, like you said, J.V. Nelson is one that we'll have to wait and see a little bit since he wasn't in that group brought up by Franklin. Um, but I, I think you feel good about what they have on the interior and, you know, good for Cooper Cousins getting that that first real action at right guard as a true freshman. I think that we've all expected him to be ready for the moment, but to get put in there and initially starting at left guard, which is not his his natural position um, to hold his own. I think that's a feather in his cap moving forward. And Cousins, by the way, he got in late against West Virginia when that game's out of hand. He got in, uh, obviously, against Kent State for a lot of work when that's a blowout. But he was in the thick of it in you know, a one-possession game in the Big Ten under the bright lights of Beaver Stadium. And he liked what you saw uh, from the freshman, another step forward uh, for him. And just noting about rotations that may or may not be in play, because you said it, Sal Wormley pretty well secured that job as his based on the way we saw right guard handled for the first few weeks. Um, same deal for Vengo Ioane at left guard. I'll just note Nolan Rucci, no rotational work this time around at right or left tackle as they got into Big Ten play. He was involved by design at right tackle and at left tackle in preceding weeks. This time he was more of a six blocker out there on the field. He played fewer than five snaps. So it seems like we have a good sense for who that starting five is when everyone is available. And by the way, four touchdown favorite this weekend against UCLA. So uh, maybe a nice opportunity to get a little more rest on that offensive front when you get deeper into the game, if that pans out accordingly, like the betting spread says it will. Uh, Jalen Kimber is the last name we have to get to. He exited late in the game. He appeared to be shaken up. Um, he's a guy who was over 40 snaps. He started his third game. We're used to seeing number three out there a bunch at this stage, along with the other transfer cornerback and A.J. Harris. And Elliott Washington playing a bunch of football on the perimeter. Uh, he held his own when he was called upon. But again, a really promising update here from James Franklin where uh, uh, that, that cornerback depth, you don't have to rely on it to handle an injury, it would seem. You still get to use it. To, to come up with different creative ways to come up with plans to, to, to encourage competitiveness on a week-to-week -week basis. But it sounds like if Kimber is available, and, and again, anticipating it, you don't have to uh, kind of recalibrate where you're at with the group. If you're Terry Smith, you get to keep moving forward and you know keep playing these guys. I will say that, that Kimber came back in later in the game after he was shaken up and he was available post game or no he wasn't sorry i just got him confused with <laughs> I, the weeks have run together a little bit already it was a late night but yeah. he did come back in uh late in the game so um you know i think you feel good about the depth there you know it was looking at the snap counts earlier today it was a little surprising to see cam miller um a little bit on the lower side um but i think that a little bit of that is is matchup dependent um with a, an illinois team that was going to pound it and also I think having Dakari Nelson at that Sam spot, you know, with his background might give you a tiny bit of flexibility that you can lean on. And I think the situation has developed that cornerback. AJ Harris isn't leaving the field unless he had a stomach bug a couple of weeks ago. Then he didn't play a bunch, but he's averaging about 50 snaps per game. Jalen Kimber's not leaving the field when he's available much. And now Elliot Washington week to week. Is seeing a lot more action. He's almost at 40 snaps last weekend. Uh, he's someone the staff has really talked about a bunch. And then when regarding Kim Miller, maybe you know that's at the expense of Zion Tracy cutting into some playing time in the nickel last week. They, they got a longer look uh, at, at, at Zion Tracy playing that slot, if you want to call it the lion 
whatever we're calling it. But uh, he actually ended up with more overall snaps than Cam Miller. And we did not see Odavian Collins, who was constantly that sixth cornerback discussed this uh, offseason, oftentimes spotlighted by the coaching staff. But his role has not materialized in the way that we anticipated in preseason camp. Hasn't been an issue for this cornerback room, uh, but just a little bit of uh, housekeeping notes there regarding that group. Uh, we did get some negative news today. Uh, while well, you got some positive outlook on, on those veterans, Cam Wallace running back, as anticipated here, um, will be out long term following that injury suffered late against Kent State. Uh, came after he scored his first touchdown. Guy who really turned some heads uh, during the spring into preseason camp. Won that third running back job uh, behind Nick Singleton and Katron Allen. He didn't get to play at all last year while red shirting. Um, someone who was moving in the right direction. Right direction. Now you push pause on that. We wish Cam Wallace well in his recovery, uh, but this means an opportunity for Quentin Martin Jr., the freshman who did not see action against Illinois, but a couple weeks ago, seven carries late against Kent State and Mark again. This seems like an opportunity if you're getting into UCLA matchup and it kind of follows the blueprint that a lot of people think. Get Nick Singleton, get Katron Allen to the sideline when you can. Get them ready for that USC matchup on the road a week later and maybe see what you got in the freshman running back, Quentin Martin Jr. Yeah, from everything we've said, really versatile. You know, uh, they, they look at him as an ex outstanding pass catcher for a true freshman. Uh, we mentioned it earlier, though. I mean, ideally you're in a spot where you have Katron Allen and Nick Singleton carrying the bulk of the load, but a knock on wood, neither of them get, get, get banged up. This offense is going to need a second running back. You really can't just fun function anymore with one running back. And, you know, I think it's also when you talk about the longevity, longevity of these backs, you don't want, even if they are capable of carrying it 30 times a game, you don't want to do that to them. So, you know, again, we don't want to see anybody banged up, but if somebody is, now it's going to be a Quinn Martin production. Now, see, you guys, you're too young for that. It's like an old TV reference. All the older folks who are listening to this are going to get that. But it, it, it's he's going to have that opportunity, and I agree with you. You know, UCLA, for people who haven't seen him, really struggling this year. Uh, you know, they've had a very difficult schedule, but Indiana went out there and kind of laid waste to them. Uh, Oregon took care of them. They really struggled. They've, they've struggled to beat Hawaii, which isn't really good. So this should be a game where a team is playing at 9 a.m. West Coast time, their time, where Penn State's able to get a bit of a lead. And I think a guy like Quinn Martin and maybe down to Corey Smith, you're able to get them some reps in a Big Ten game uh, that really, you know, not that they would necessarily be when the game is on the line, but just getting him out there in a Big Ten game, I think, will be good for both of them. Daniel, you and I covered a lot of ground on the offense on Saturday night. But just going back, uh, that we have a better kind of picture of what it looked like for this passing game. Coming out of a win over a ranked team, uh, I, I don't think a lot of people would have thought Drew Aller would end up with 46 yards, uh, 46 passing yards in the second half unless they were well ahead of this game. And we know it wasn't that way, but they leaned on the ground game so well. They threw seven passes after halftime. On the day, 135 passing yards. That's his lowest total since the November 2023 matchup when he was knocked out early against Rutgers with an injury issue. Um, his average depth of target was down from about 12 and a half yards through non-conference action to six yards against Illinois. And, and with all that said, Daniel, we're not coming out of this game running to the panic button about this offense. And, and we just kind of saw the, the the ground game and the offensive line take over just as James Franklin challenged them. But where is your head at with this pass attack? UCLA, I think don't think a lot of people are, are fixated on what it's going to look like there. But when you're traveling out to Los Angeles and going up against what has been kind of a high flying USC offense at times, feels like you might need some points. You might need some explosive plays. Any concern from you that we didn't necessarily see that from the aerial attack uh, last Saturday? And, and and what do you think it may mean moving ahead? Yeah, I, I don't really have any concern coming out of that performance against Illinois. I think that, you know, Brett Bielema knows what he wants to do in that game. Um, Aaron Henry, I think, has done a good job with that defense. And I think they did a nice job of, of taking away that deep stuff for Drew Aller. I think I said it in the postgame podcast that, you know, we weren't, we didn't see a lot of deep throws and it wasn't because like last year where it felt like they were still leaving stuff on the table. You know, they were still, they were leaving plays out there. You know, we didn't see the deep throws this past weekend, but it didn't really feel like that 
they left a lot of missed opportunities out there. That's how I came away uh, with it feeling. I mean, I think that Omari Evans deep ball, that's maybe the one uh, where hit him in stride. That's a touchdown. Um, but you still got 15 yards out of it. Um, but I, I just think it was the game flow. Uh, Franklin said on Monday that um, the game went how Illinois wanted it to for, for much of the day. I know that he was maybe talking a little bit more about their offense and how they, and being able to run the ball and not having to throw on their end. But I think their defense also did a, a nice job of that, of taking away those explosive plays. Um, you know, I saw a comment that uh, Drew Aller is still only a game manager uh, in big games. Um, sometimes you have to be like, sometimes that's just how the game goes. And it felt like the offense stayed within itself. Um, it didn't never really got out of sync, stayed confident. Um, I think you do want to see more production, but you leave, you miss two field goals and then you get into a, a weird fourth down situation where, you know, maybe the kicking factored into that a little bit. Um, and you leave a couple points on the board that way, things look a little bit different. Like I think coming out of a, a 27 to seven game, you, you look at things maybe a, a tiny bit differently. So I coming out of it, I mean, I think that you would like to see those explosive plays every week, but that's how things go, uh, it, especially against a, a defense like Illinois and a team like the Illini. You know, they weren't going to make it easy. They weren't going to give you those plays. So I think Penn State did a good job of taking what Illinois was giving it to them. And when those running backs are running like they were, why not ride them? Just a few notes on that receiver group, guys. Uh, Julian Fleming, uh, he's playing a bunch. I know people are looking for the stats right now. He's at 35-plus snaps in all four games so far. He's over 40 snaps the last couple of matchups. Uh, pretty well ahead of anybody not named Harrison Wallace in terms of their game-to-game -game involvement. Omari Evans situated right around the mid-20s. He, he's he's pretty consistently been the third guy or fourth guy in that mix, depending on what Liam Clifford's doing. In this case, uh, Mark, you did spot Liam Clifford at the end of this game with his, with his helmet off on the sideline while the primary offense was still operating. Uh, Liam's a guy that, again, we'll be looking for on the practice field Wednesday. He was not brought up directly uh, by James Franklin, but he had kind of a season low in snap totals as, as he was affected by something we anticipate. Uh, but it was only those guys, only four receivers involved over the course of this matchup and i think that gives us a quick opportunity to bring up caden saunders because he was brought up to james franklin that punt returner situation and it's a spot as we've said he's pretty much been the designated fair catcher for the most part back there there was a fumble a couple games ago and a game that really could have cost you with bowling green um there was a 23 yard return late against kent state but it feels like primarily it's been waving that hand bringing the ball to the chest giving the ball to the offense and Mark, James Franklin, again, referencing that lingering in injury issue that, that he says has prevented Caden from taking a step forward in the offensive plans. He's yet to play a down at receiver through four matchups, and that's really a surprise where he was in early August, sounded like an ascending figure in the offense. But injury aside, and almost Caden Saunders aside, I think the question that a lot of fans have, and maybe some of us in the media are, what are the other options out there? Maybe someone who can provide a spark after seeing Daquan Hardy go all conference on everyone for the final half of the 2023 campaign and what that did to set up the offense at times. Zion Tracy is the name that James Franklin went to immediately uh, and, and kind of talking about who could be on the on the heels of Caden Saunders, per se. He mentioned Jake Spencer, got a little work, Colgate transfer. He had some previous college experience at punt returner, but the ball hit the ground and uh, he didn't get any more work. And so where do you think uh, kind of what do you make of James Franklin, I guess, and, and his summary of the punt returner situation? And are you like like a lot of us kind of wondering is there more that Penn, Penn State can get from that spot to benefit its offense? Yeah, somebody mentioned this on the board. You know, I don't know how many opportunities they've had to actually return punts. I mean, a lot of them have either been short or um, the kickers have done a good job eating up a bunch of the, 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 the hang time or whatever you would call it. So I'm anxious to see what happens when they actually get the opportunity to do it. I'm also interested to see what happens – when, when they think Caden Saunders is ready to start contributing at wideout, is that when maybe you move Zion Tracy over there? Because he's not seeing as many reps over on – I doubt he's going to see quite that many reps on defense. So maybe that's an opportunity where you could, you could give somebody else a look. But I just don't know that he, they've had that many opportunities. I mean, are there – do you are you guys remembering instances where he fair caught something? And it's like, well, why are you doing that? You you, you definitely should have run with it. I, 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 I'm I just, there might've been one or two, but I'm just not remembering all that many. 
I think I think really the defining theme of and and Justin Lustig, you know, really said that this is what they love about Caden Saunders. But the defining theme here has been the comfort level of knowing that the ball is not going to bounce 20 yards backwards or that the guy's not going to fumble it. Although we, we've seen Caden Saunders have some ball security issues. Yeah. Um, but it feels like there's almost and, you know, to your point, Mark, have the opportunities been there? But it almost feels like an aggressive punt returner, which does come with some risk. But that's what yeah. Daquan Hardy was last year, right? He was I an know. aggressive punt returner, and it cost them a bit with field position on the road at Ohio State. But Daniel, I guess that's kind of the point. People are saying, is there an aggressive presence that could perhaps be there at punt returner versus this very conservative and comfortable approach? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that you have to find a happy medium at some point. I mean, I do think that at a certain level, Daquan Hardy was a little bit of an outlier last year. I mean, no one, like no one in history had returned to two punts for a touchdown in the same game. Um, so I, I don't think that that's something that is just kind of there on the roster necessarily. At the same time, we didn't know that until we saw it in that UMass game. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think if you're Penn State, you, you have to find the, the happy medium at the very least you know, to find someone who you feel comfortable with catching the ball, someone who will make the right decisions and, and be comfortable back there, but who can also do a, a little bit after the catch. I do think that they think Caden Saunders can be that person. Maybe if he wasn't injured, we would have seen some of this. Um, I mean, I think that he's been, when we've seen him return the ball, it's looked okay until the end when you know, the ball comes out, something like that. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to see where this lands. Um, you know, the way that Franklin talked about it today, it does sound like they gave a lot of people opportunities to win the job during camp when Saunders was sidelined and no one was able to step up to do it, um, which is, is interesting to me. Um, so we'll see with Zion Tracy, if they do decide to, you know, if you do get a little bit of a lead and you're, you know, comfortable with where you are in the game flow. Maybe you put him back there to get that experience. Um, that's something that, you know, Mark talked about not having a lot of opportunities in the game for Penn State to have punt returns. You know, in practice, you don't do a lot of live punt return reps. That was something that James Franklin talked about last year when Daquan Hardy took over the job and everyone was like, wait, where was this th the whole time? Um, so it, it's something that, I think the the longer the season goes on and if this kind of continues, the more it's going to become, I think, something that stands out, especially when the offense is playing pretty well, the defense is playing pretty well. Special teams is where you, you really can't afford to have mistakes, leave points out there, leave yards out there, because that can really cost you on the margins. So we'll, we'll see. It's a, you know, now a third of the way through the season, it's starting to you know, become more of who the special teams unit is than maybe the uplip or an outlier. Guys, yeah. let me tell you just one thing. After watching the Eagles against Tampa Bay, <laughs> I am completely comfortable with somebody just catching the ball. You know, <laughs> if, if 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 Penn State doesn't have its own guys running into the punt, re <laughs> punt returner or blocking somebody into the punt returner and causing a fumble, it was unbelievable that that happened at that level. I'm half joking, but you could almost see where the value is and having somebody who could just catch the damn ball without his teammates running into him. No, I was, I was watching my Packers yesterday, and the Vikings uh, returner just had a ball go over his head. He just completely misjudged it <laughs> in the sun, in the wind, and it hit off his helmet, and Packers got the ball at the three. I mean, it's I think it's something that looks pretty easy when, like, Caden Saunders is back there just fair catching it and not doing anything. It's kind of like, oh, anyone can do that. But in the NFL, you see it, and it's kind of like, ooh, this can this can cost you. Maybe Caden Saunders can be the happy medium. Maybe he can take that next step forward as he gets healthier. I mean, we're just curious about it because we've seen him practicing when we get our looks with those receivers with the primary unit, uh, but he has not gotten any work with any Kotal Nicky squad. And, and, and it's just it's interesting to see because Caden Saunders spent so much of the offseason talking about his high confidence, high comfort level. And so when it comes to health, injury, all that stuff in play, it's a little bit murky. And right now that's where we are with Caden Saunders. Um, guys, in, in the last few minutes here, I want to get to, to Abdul Carter in a moment. We're going to look back at, at how we did on our predictions for this past matchup. But let's stick with special teams because the kicker situation, all due respect to the punt returner spot, that's the one that everyone's focused in on right now. Sanders Sahedak, uh, 
0 for 2 on those 40 yard field goal attempts against Illinois. That was one hanging in the balance deep into the matchup, and you were wondering if it might cost them in a major way. Uh, then we saw Ryan Barker, second year walk on addition from in state, end up getting the last extra point opportunity. As we referenced on the post game podcast, when I brought this subject up to James Franklin afterwards, he said Sanders said he'd actually be celebrating with his teammates after a win, uh, and all a lot of good things about him as a person. But he also acknowledged that they, they, you know, they need to have a competition. Ultimately, it's going to come down to who earns the spot, and we'll see who is the first place kicker trotted out on Saturday. Like I said, chance here to maybe work out the kinks before you go on the road and play a, a top 15 Trojans team, Mark. And I, I just feel like this is not a conversation you want to be carrying with you to the West Coast a week from now. We're recording this on Monday, and James Franklin now does his um, press conference on Monday. And he was kind of asked about, you know, were they – in preseason practice was, you know, how successful was he or something like that. And James basically said, well, yeah, I mean, the, the guy who won the job was the most successful guy in, in practice. Hey, we're beyond that now, though, right? You know, we had Chuck Fusina, a former Penn State quarterback, on the Nitwits TV show that I do. And one thing that he said that I wanted to point out is the way that Sahadak's teammates rallied around him after he missed that. I didn't necessarily see it, but he was in the stance, and he said it was, like, really cool to see everybody coming over to him. That's great. And the way he handled himself when we talked to him a couple weeks ago, remember the video I put up, how humble he was, how he talked about how tough last season was, but he wanted to be a team player. All of that's great. And you wish that it would have worked out for the kid, but now you're in a situation where he's what two of five this year and didn't make a kick last year. And you're in the big 10 season and whatever's happening in practice isn't translating to the game. So you have to make the move now. I mean, if this game is going to play out the way we expect it to play out and I, this isn't something that we're taking lightly folks. I mean, I think if, if you haven't had a chance to see UCLA, they're really struggling. I mean, they're really struggling. If this if this game plays out, this is a great opportunity to give somebody else that uh, that that chance to to prove themselves in game conditions. And I think you absolutely have to make the move. I, I don't know what what competition could happen in practice now that's going to be any diff, different than what we saw, or what, not that we saw, but that what took <laughs> took place uh, in, in the preseason and. I have nothing but respect for Sanders Sahadek and the way he's carried himself. And I don't want this to come across as being anything other than looking at if this coaching staff wants what's in the best interest of this team, I think you have to give somebody else the opportunity in a game to get it done. Yeah, Ryan Barker was the first guy we saw get that chance. Of course, Chase Meyer was a starter for Tulsa uh, as a place kicker last year, made the move in January. We haven't seen him involved in game work to this point. Um, so that, that's certainly a lingering issue that, that we really can't shed much more light on until we see a kicker trotted out there uh, on, on this Saturday and see who it is and, and how they do in that opportunity. Um, as we said, Abdul Carter, he has really shown up. And, and Mark, you pointed to him as your player to watch. Oh, uh, I did? Oh, yeah, wow. Did. Nice, nicely done. Shouldn't have brought it up. Uh, but, yeah, you did. And uh, and he was just that. And I thought really from the start, I think I mentioned it to you, Daniel, in the press box. But he was kind of working the student section. He was working his teammates. He was fired up. He was passionate. And you combine that with his performance, uh, three and a half tackles for loss, the game ceiling forced fumble, the, to officially put that one on ice, um, You know, getting to the quarterback again. He's done that in back-to-back -back games now. And ultimately – being named Big Ten Defensive Player of the Week for what we just saw. I asked James today about Abdul Carter and maybe what his role is going to look like the remaining eight games as Tom Allen and Dion Barnes and, and Franklin you know, try to work up the best plan. What do you think about how they can maximize him in these upcoming pro, uh, premier matchups that lay ahead for them? And Because he's the guy it feels like if there's one wrecking ball right now, especially with K.J. Winston out, he's that guy who can – tip a game and tip the scale of an outcome with, with one flash play. Yeah. I, I think there's a little bit of a balancing act with that because if he is your best pass rusher and like, like you believe he is, then, you know, how often do you want him dropping back into coverage? How often do you want him not doing that thing that, that he is the best at, but I thought that they got creative with him uh, on Saturday 
I thought they used some different packages that we hadn't quite seen yet this year, especially on third down, um, you know, lining him up, dropping him in the coverage, rushing him from the second level. Um, I thought that was a, a good way to maybe unlock some of that pass rushing ability too, because that was one of the things that James Franklin mentioned with Carter making that switch. You don't have that running start anymore when you're coming in from defensive end like you do a linebacker. The engagement is is much quicker. Um, but I, I just think that at this point, he is that player where the opposing defense has to be aware of him before every single snap, even if he's lined up at the second level. Franklin talked about putting him at both defensive end spots over the course of a game just to have that on tape and, and something else that a, opposing offenses have to think about. I think that this is maybe how we envisioned him being used a little bit coming into the season when Franklin still teased the fact that he would play some linebacker. Um, and knowing the skill set that he has, that obviously we think he can pass the, we can he can rush the passer really well. Obviously, a lot of NFL types think that too at this point. But we also know he can do a lot of other different things. So you know, we'll find out what that actually looks like as the season goes on. But I think they'll continue to get more and more creative as this goes on. Uh, something to to monitor is is he's gonna maybe make a push for all American candidates candidacy and, and continue to push his draft stock in the right direction and in the process really make Penn State's defensive force. Um, when we look at our predictions, uh, we all have Penn State winning but not covering that 18 point spread. That proved to be the case. Uh, Mark had a 17 point spread at 34 17. Me and Daniel, unbeknownst to us at the time when we submitted our picks, had the same score, 31 uh, 17. We all expected more points, but I think we were right in the, in the wheelhouse as far as how this one turned out. And because we love uh, validation and, and we love shame even a little bit more, maybe on this podcast, we're also going to go through our bowl predictions each week to review those. So, Mark, what do you have? How it turned out? I had. Um... Katron Allen and Nick Singleton combining for four carries of 20 yards or more, when in fact, Penn State did not have a carry of 20 yards or more. So that didn't quite work out. But what I would say is that they had four different guys with carries of 10 yards or more. And they had so many of those, you know, five, six, eight, 10, 14 yard carries. Uh, I definitely didn't win it, but I think what they were able to do in the running game. What, and the other thing that I would say, I, what they were able to do in the running game, I think, was was obviously impressive. The other thing I would say is that there were three or four carries in that game where they were this close, this close to breaking it long. And it's been kind of that way most of the season, right? I mean, we even saw uh, Cam Wallace with a couple of those. So it, is this the week? You know, I'm not going to get into my bold predictions just yet. I have time to come up with it. But I, I think they're right there. They're just this close to being able to break it. So I wasn't quite on, but I'm still comfortable that the running game played well and that I, I had an idea that it would. You were on the money. Big game for Katron Allen, Nick Singleton, just maybe in a different method than yeah. what we anticipated or what you anticipated. Daniel, uh, y- yeah, you were – you were getting close there toward the end. There were some opportunities. You had three interceptions for Luke Altmaier, a guy who had thrown no interceptions coming into the matchup, but ended up with those two late turnovers. And I think he put at least another ball in harm's way as things were getting out of hand. Yeah, it was the um, the ball that Abdul Carter knocked down. AJ Harris was was waiting, and I asked AJ after the game if he was going to pick it, and he was just like, he's like, yeah. Yeah, that was <laughs> that was a pick for me, um, but but he got there later. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think you know, maybe I give myself like 1.25 credit out of three, you know, one pick and, and the fumble uh, at the end for two turnovers for Altmaier. Um, but the defense needed to step up and made a play. Uh, I also just pulled up my my players to watch uh, just to double check that. And looks like I had Katron Allen uh, there. So I I think that that played out as, as we thought it might. As in Durant, as we're tooting our own horns, I might as well toot mine too. And and, uh, I was probably the the furthest from the the hole uh, in terms of of getting this one right. I had Drew Aller getting to 300 yards back-to-back weeks. Uh, He was not halfway to 300 yards. But again, not viewing this as a step backward for QB1, maybe viewing it more as a step aside for QB1 on this particular Saturday night. Um, So there we are. We're going to have more bowl predictions and and score predictions for you when we close out this week. In between this episode and that episode, you're going to hear from a UCLA beat reporter within our 24-7 Sports Network. Get us a better look at the Big Ten newcomers who have struggled out of the gate. And we'll also break down the latest on recruiting for coming off a very eventful weekend in Happy Valley with that 
not quite white out opportunity. And then uh, a, another one coming Saturday for another home game. So Tyler Calvaruso will, will give us a lot of updates from the recruiting trail. But for now, fellas, Mark Brennan, uh, Daniel Gallen, I'm Tyler Donahue. This has been the Lions 24-7 podcast.